All right. So we begin our fourth session again tonight on our series on Orthodox spirituality. And um, just by way of review, uh, I want to make sure that we have a, uh, a seamless um, a seamless program going on here. Um, I hope to make this as organized as I can, even though I've never been an organized person. I've always seen life as, as being more of an artistic person, which means that we kind of play hopscotch. We go here, and then we go there, and then we work on this project, and then when we're done working on this thing, we go, go to something else, and it usually drives everyone who has, what, the left brain or the right brain? What's the engineering side of the brain. The left brain, it makes you crazy. But I still want this to have some order. So remember that um, we've spent the last few sessions really not defining, but really trying to articulate as best we can the basics of Orthodox spirituality as having to do with an encounter. That the encounter is between the true God and ourselves in our fallen human condition, and that we emphasize that this encounter has the divine initiative, meaning that it is the Lord himself who begins the whole process. And this is something, of course, that we see is very scriptural. We find that the beginning of salvation history with Abraham in the 12th chapter of Genesis it's the Lord himself who calls Abraham, right? Get you out. Go forth out of your father's house into the land that I will show you, and I will make you the father of many nations. And Abraham doesn't even think about it. He doesn't reason about it. He doesn't try to figure it out what the Lord is telling him. He immediately, literally probably drops everything, and acting out of pure faith, he journeys into this new land, to this far land, away from his home, away from his family, all of his cousins, and he uh, lives as a sojourner uh, in Canaan. Uh, it's the Lord who takes the initiative, and it's the same thing through the scriptures, through and through. And this is very important, as we'll see, because what we've said is that our whole spiritual life is about this divine encounter and the way that we respond to the Lord who is coming to us. Remember, we spoke during our first session about the Lord in the Greek as the erhomenos, the coming one. He came, he will come at the very end of time, and he is coming right now to encounter us in, in order to evoke from us this simple trust and this simple faith so that we can be his disciples. We've also said that the God in whom we love and in whom we believe must be the one true God and not the God with a small g that we have created after our own image and likeness, correct? Because one of the great catastrophes of human life is that we love our idols. And these idols literally are the gods that we have fashioned according to our wishes. We talked a little bit about Sigmund Freud and how he defined religion as being the projection of all of these best wishes and dreams and hopes that human beings had in their, in their historical infancy onto some type of a arch archetypal father figure, right? But um, it's really the opposite that is true. What it is is that uh, the Lord himself, because he loves us, has created us in his own image and likeness. And so the, the great catastrophe or tragedy of idolatry is that we reverse this divine initiative and this divine grace. And even as Christians, it is very possible for us to make up our own God. You know, and even though, as I said last week, we confess in the creed something profoundly uh, uh, important. You know, I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, begotten, not made. Of course, Athanasius, St. Basil the Great, Gregory of Nazianzus, they were speaking against Arius and about how Arius also philosophized the gospel and made up his own Jesus according to his own intellectual whims or, or thoughts or ideas or ideologies. But really when we say begotten, not made, it means that we are not allowed uh, to, um, to, to project or to uh, um, create our own, our own God.
God. I found a really wonderful passage, All the Fullness of God, in this book by Father Tom Hopko. It's a collection of essays. And in this one essay, which is called Witness and Service in the Orthodox Christian Life, he speaks about the problem that we have, and he's writing at the end of the 20th century, about the reductions of Christ we see all around us. And so he writes this. At this point, we are obliged to confront another difficulty peculiar, peculiar to our time. And this is the fact that Christ himself is all too often co-opted into one or another of the many simplifications and reductions of man that are produced by this insane world in which we live. And the clearest demonstration of this, at least in my own mind, is revealed and the many different and contradictory Christs, with a small c, which are available today for anyone's choosing. So he's saying it's like a salad bar out there. You want this, you want that, you can make it up as you go along. So he goes on, and this is the good part. There is the Christ of secular humanism, and the Christ of religious mysticism, the Christ of political activism, and the Christ of cultic ritualism. There's the Christ of the feminists and the Christ of the nationalists, that's for sure, especially here in the beginning of the 21st century. There's the Christ of the poor and the oppressed and the Christ of the powerful and the possessing. There is the Christ of the Marxist critique of history and the Christ of the psychotherapeutic analysis of human behavior, that'd be Sigmund Freud. There is the hidden Christ of the non-Christian religions and the revealed Christ of the fundamentalist preachers. There is the Christ of the process thinkers and the Christ of the existentialist or essentialist philosophers. There is the sweet Christ of the pietists and the avenging Christ of the freedom fighters. And in my own churchly circles, there is even the Christ who was called upon as a necessary element in the resurrection and the establishment, re-establishment of the Russian, Ukrainian, Albanian, whatever nations that they might be said to. So you really see where he brings that that whole thing to light. Um, and this is just uh, in, in a more social um, dimension. He doesn't even speak there about what we do personally with all of this. So the Christ that we believe in is the one true God who has shown himself to us. How? By dying on the cross. And, and this is the only path uh, to our salvation, which is to accept him as he is. As he is. And, and not let our own rationality, our own thinking, or our own ideas get in the way. And that's not to say that learning and education and theology and even some good academics, you know, are, are not helpful, because they certainly are. But before any of that, there is this direct encounter between God and man, between earth and heaven, and it has to do with the second person of the Holy Trinity, the man who was born from his virgin mother, our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only one to whom we have uh, uh, any sense of, of being able to entrust with the totality of our lives. Why? As, as we've said already, because no one else loves us and no one else cares for us. No one else knows us better than we, better than he does. And as I like to preach quite often, the reason that we trust in Christ is because he knows us even better than we know ourselves, yes, but even Christ in, in this life of faith, he becomes closer to us than we are to our own self. And that's a mystery, and that, that's, also, that's, also, um, that's also a miracle, isn't it? We also said, by way of review, are you following me, that... We have to know where we're going. And what does the Lord want from us in this life of faith, which we identify as being the spiritual life? The Lord wants us not only to imitate him, and this is something we find in, in many Western writers, um, which is fine, but we would, we would uh, add one more very important thing in that it's not about simply morality. Uh, about identifying ourselves with this ethical Christ. Because you get into trouble there, actually. Uh, Christ did not come down from heaven to earth in order to establish better ethics. That's not why he died on the cross. Even though morality and ethics 
are part of the plan. They're not the whole thing. Um, so we believe that Christ came down from heaven to earth in order to show us how high we can go. And this is where we brought up the point about theosis, that we will never be truly human unless we are on the road, on the path, literally, literally to what we call in the Orthodox Church deification or theosis. And this is that God has made us for himself as human beings uniquely, and that because we are created after his image and likeness, he shares with us all of his infinite and supreme goodness. Every good thing that God is and that God possesses in himself, he shares with us, and here's the caveat, by grace. By grace. And why do we emphasize that? That's all over the Pauline epistles. St. Paul writes it all the time. By grace. Why? Because God is God and we are not God. We make that critical delineation from the start. But still, our whole calling of, of holiness to holiness is about sharing in this goodness of God that we see exemplified, especially, and I just touched on it briefly last week, in, in the lives of the saints, the Holy Fathers, and especially in the person of the Mother of God, who is herself the image of our redeemed humanity, who is herself the image of the bride, the church, as the, as the, excuse me, as the bride of Christ. Um, so this is not just, again, abstract the theological um, talk. It's all very concrete, and it's all, all been uh, very much evidenced for us. Um, even, we would say, in the flesh, first of all, with Christ, and then through the lives uh, of all the saints. And this is why um, we uh, spoke about the importance of theosis. How high are we going to go? What does the Lord call us to be? Um, and then not to allow ourselves to accept anything less, which is the devil's plan. Really, which is, which is the devil's plan. I also mentioned here last week, uh, and we'll, we'll tie into the rest of tonight's uh, class, that uh, when it comes to theosis, uh, what this means is that we become perfectly united to God. And we speak about this in Trinitarian terms. And I, I say this over and over, that it's Christ who evokes from us this life of faith by following him uniquely, genuinely. The Lord sends to us the Holy Spirit from the Father, and then the Spirit in Christ or through Christ reconciles us to, um, uh, to God the Father himself. In Christ through the Spirit, what's the other one, the preposition? To the Father. And, and this is this relational aspect. Um, and um, to understand what it means to live in communion with God is, is almost an unspeakable thing. It's almost an unspeakable thing. E even though um, the church gives us all of the teachings, especially uh, the teachings of our Lord from the Gospel, uh, that tell us what this means. And, uh, we are reading uh, during this time of holy, uh, the Holy Resurrection in our church. We're, we're remembering these beautiful words from St. John's Gospel. We read them on Great and Holy Thursday evening. You know, he who believes in me, he who keeps my commandments, it is he that loves me and my Father and, and me. We will come and we will make our dwelling with them. We will make our dwelling with you. I and you and, you know, and you and me, um, this is, this is the, the, the most perfect expression in the scriptures of, of what this, this oneness with God uh, is all about. The Trinity is this mystery of oneness, a oneness of persons, and we enter into that perfect oneness or unity by the grace of God, and thereby we overcome all of our division and, and all of our isolation as, as human beings. And I don't like the word relationships. You remember I spoke about this? I don't like the word relationship because this is a more philosophical, um, actually an enlightenment phrase that was used and 
It's about individuals having relationships with other individuals. And whenever you have a relationship, it has to be negotiated. It has to be negotiated by some kind of conventional rule. Uh, and in Christ, there is no negotiation. There is no negotiation. There is only Christ and his infinite love. There is nothing in between that manages what we would now call a relationship between two individuals. You see, this is why this language is very difficult. When, when I hear people speak about, I've got a personal relationship with Christ, I say, okay, but you know, there's nothing about having a personal relationship in the scriptures. There's no word relationship in the scriptures. What do you mean by that? It, it means that it can be negotiated. And it's not your relationship, even if it's a relationship. It's his. Right? You know, I mean, so we could go to town with that in a, in a lot of different ways. But tonight, I'm going to choose not to go down that rabbit hole. But we'll stay on, we'll stay on course and we'll stay on uh, topic. So, Part of the spiritual life also means coming to terms with the reality of sin and brokenness. We all know what sin is. The, the, maybe the catechetical teaching about sin is that it is a transgression of God's commandment. And you know, commandments are there. The, the commandments of the Lord are there not to restrict us, not to make us unhappy, not to take our freedom away, but to do one thing, to protect us. And he gives us then our freedom. And he says, go ahead, live your life. The first step towards being a disciple is to keep the commandments. And I like that Jewish story, the Hasidic rabbis. They say, why did the Lord, out of all the other nations of the earth, choose this little itty-bitty Bedouin confederation of tribes? Why did they choose Israel and not Egypt, or choose Israel and, and not any of the Mesopotamians, the Hittites, or the Assyrians, or the Syrians, or the Persians? These were far greater and more sophisticated uh, and powerful and wealthy and rich uh, empires. They, but the Lord chose the, the Jewish people, these little people of Israel. And the Hasidic rabbis say there's one reason, because the Lord asked all of these other nations to enter into a covenant uh, with him. And they all came back and said, we want to negotiate 10 to 9, 10 commandments. Well, let's try 9. Let's try 8. Just, I think it's very telling, you know. But Israel was the only people on the face of the earth who accepted those commandments, the covenant at face value and for what they were and then had to live with that for the next 1500 years uh, which is one of St. Paul's major uh, theological uh, um, uh, premises about what the law meant for the people of Israel how it showed them and revealed them and revealed to us that we are broken and sinful and that we cannot in any way um, do anything to make our lives better. The law is here to show us how broken we are. The law is here to show us how broken we are because no man, except our Lord Jesus Christ when he came, has ever kept all of the commandments. All of the commandments. So sin is keeping the commandments, not keeping the commandments, the uh, uh, betrayal of the commandments, um, which we all know. And we all know that whenever we confess, you know, we have PhDs in these sins. Right? We, I mean, we really do. I mean, especially the older we get, you know, and, and our own stupidity and our, our foolishness, all of these sins and passions, they become habitual. They become habitual and they drive themselves into us, you know, time after time after time after time. And then we know that only through repentance, confession, purification, prayer, as we're going to speak about, can we have any hope to be delivered from this sin 
and, and this passion, which, which I'm going to get into in, in a little bit more, more detail. Uh, but sin itself is also, in, in a more literal way, the missing of the mark. Amartalos in Greek. It means to miss the mark. So the archer does what? He pulls back on the bow, he lets loose the arrow, and where does the arrow go? Anywhere but where it's supposed to. See? So this is what our lives are. So think of our lives as being this arrow that is meant to be uh, directed towards the Lord, towards theosis, and because we also have our fingers on the bow, we have, um, we have shot that arrow in the wrong direction. Um, and we'll talk about what the consequences of that um, missing the mark are. Um, in the book of Genesis, we have this interesting dialogue that goes on between Adam and Eve, and between Eve and the serpent. And I, I'd like to dwell on this a bit. We've touched on it already. But remember that the beginning of sin and passion, and the beginning of the fall itself for us as human beings, is when Eve <coughs> turns her mind from the light to the darkness and enters into a conversation with Satan, with the serpent. The, the very second that she did that, it's all over. That's what sin is, a turning of the mind and heart from the light to the darkness. And then she has this conversation with the devil, and the devil will always win. The devil will always win. And this conversation is sometimes just glossed over, unfortunately, but it has really deep meaning. So the devil comes and does his work through delusion. He is the father of what? Lies. Father of lies. And so his work is to lie and to make people swallow that lie for us fishermen, hook, line, and sinker, so to speak. And so what did he do to Eve? He said... You shall not die. He's lying. He's actually calling God the liar, right? The Lord told you, do not eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you do, you will surely die. And then the serpent comes and says, no, 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 no. No, he, he wasn't saying it right. You, you will not die. That's the first great lie, right? But if you partake of this, you will become like a god or like a god knowing good and evil and what this means is that not only do adam and eve um, begin to know at a point when they were actually kind of not ready to know yet that was the, the father's wax on this a lot you know they never said that the lord was going to keep the the tree of the knowledge of good and evil away from adam forever he wanted adam and eve to to develop and, and mature a little bit. And when they were ready, then the Lord would have said, okay, here it is. Um, but they were not ready for it. And so Eve is deluded because she thinks that she can be self-sufficient, right? You can be a God. You can be your own God. You can define yourself. And when this happens, our humanity becomes its own end because there's no longer any frame of reference. This is really important. Part of our fallen existence is that we use our own, our humanity, our, our fallen humanity, as the measure of all things. You know, even the Greek philosopher said, man is the measure of himself. How do we understand the human being? Once this happens with Eve, with, once we have the fall of Adam and Eve, um, not only are we missing the mark, but we've lost our reference point. I have an interesting text here, a little bit thick, but I like to challenge my audience. <laughs> By Zezulus, Metropolitan John Zezulus, being as communion about the fall and about what this means for us as human beings. For since the fall, meaning the fall of all of us from God, results in the claim of created man to be the ultimate point of reference. See? In existence, that is to be God, he actually says it, it is in the final analysis, the state of existence whereby the created world tends to posit its being ultimately, which means to situate 
its, its reality, um, ultimately with reference to itself and not to the uncreated being, to God. Idolatry is the turning form that that fall takes. But what lies behind it is the fact that man refuses to refer created being, meaning our lives and everything that exists, man refuses to refer created being to communion with God. In other words, viewed from the point of being, he calls it ontology, the fall consists in the refusal to make being, our existence, dependent on communion. In a rupture between truth and communion. Isn't that great stuff? Did you understand it? Right? It means we, we, we no longer have anything to look to uh, because we become blind and, and we become ignorant. Now we also have here the fact that with the fall of Adam and Eve, human beings not only run away, but they also hide. And they also pretend. And this is where we all are. We all have to come to terms with our own hiding and pretending. So Adam and Eve, they run away from the Lord and they hide in the garden when they hear him walking in the cool of the day. And then Adam cries out, where are you? And you know, like I like to say, it's a rhetorical question. The Lord knows exactly where they are, but he asks the question so that they can ask it of themselves. What happened to you? Look what, look, look what happened. You know, you run away and you hide. And you hide because you do not want to see the glory, because once you see the glory, then you realize you have something to contrast with the fact that you are now naked and ashamed, right? So that, that whole reality in, in this spiritual sense about running away and hiding from God, pretending that we can make our life uh, something that is, is um, successful, that we can find our own happiness in life uh, by, by being you know, the captain of, a, captain of our own ship. There was, a, I think, an American poet or, or an English poet that, that wrote about that. You know who it was, Joe? No, I know what poem you're talking about. Right. I am the captain of my ship, and I, I am in command of my destiny. This is very American, isn't it? You know? And if you don't do that, then you're considered a fool and a failure. Um, but we say that this is, of course, all from the devil and, and the demons, and that the more we try to do this, the darker it gets. And, and the more miserable that we're, we're going to end up. The consequences of our falling away from God, there are consequences. When we raise our teenagers, you know, we're kind of saying the same things. You're all going to make bad decisions. But remember, there are decisions that are bad and there are decisions that are bad. There are decisions that are going to put you in a lot of hot water and then there are decisions that may not have as many negative consequences. Think about what you're doing. So there are negative consequences, even from the very beginning. And the consequences are exile, bondage, fratricide, death. And so we not only speak about exile, they are exiled from the garden and from the tree of life, uh, which we're going to also explain a, a little bit. Uh, but they are also enslaved. They become enslaved in bondage. And then the first human act, historical act, outside of the Garden of Eden is fratricide. Cain murders his brother Abel. And the blood of Abel spills to the ground, and from then on, the ground is cursed by his blood. And, and the, the scriptures are very powerful, and we all are all, all reaping you know, this, this, this great sin. But we also have these beautiful hymns during Holy Week and during the crucifixion of our Lord during Great and Holy Friday, that one single drop of our Lord's blood from that cross onto the earth has cleansed the entire cosmos, right? So it's undone that original, uh, that original curse. You know, by your precious blood, you have redeemed us from the bondage to sin. By your precious blood. This is one of the hymns that we sing on Great and Holy Friday. 
Cain is then judge, and he is also exiled from exile. He's exiled into the land of Nod. Now, where's Nod? Nobody knows what Nod is, but we can speak about it allegorically. Nod is the place where people live and no longer remember about God or about anything that has to do with eternal life or paradise. So Adam and Eve are standing outside of the garden, and they're weeping over their exile. Now, it's possible with Cain that he's not only exiled from the paradise that God made, but he becomes exiled from the exile, and so he no longer remembers. He no longer even knows. He might dream about something. Maybe some of the carnal passions have some semblance of, of, the, of the first you know, bliss and, and pleasures that were given in the Garden of Eden, but there's, there's nothing more. It's, it's, it's ignorance, and it's darkness, and, and it's um, disorientation, lost, right? It's, it's this kind of existential um, situation. And as I mentioned before, we are enslaved to our sins and passions because we no longer have the capacity or the ingenuity. I like that word, ingenuity. We have no longer the strength or the ingenuity or the, or the, or the brain power or whatever in order to extr extricate ourselves from the hole that we've dug for ourselves and that we keep digging deeper and deeper and deeper as long as we're believing in uh, the lies uh, of the devil. Now, we also want to say this, that death came into the world, and we are all going to die. <coughs> um, this is actually part of the spiritual life, but in another, uh, in another class, I'll, I'll deal with this, about the, the positive aspects of that, about keeping a constant remembrance of one's death, and having this death before one's eyes, that uh, keeps us sober, keeps us grounded, um, keeps us humble and, and keeps us in a state of prayer um, and also facilitates this very healthy fear of God. Fear of God is a wonderful thing. It, it's not, you know, the fear of God in this hateful, vindictive, you know, sense, but it, it's, it's, a very, it's, a very saving, it's a very saving virtue. But so from whence comes evil and from whence comes death? Okay, these are philosophical questions. But the scriptures really give us this, this, incredible, uh, this incredible teaching. That evil exists on the face of earth, having nothing to do with God. If God did not create or even intend evil, where did it come from? We all know it comes from Satan first, and then it comes into the world through the agency of the human heart. Out of the heart of man flows all kinds of iniquity and evil, right? The Lord uh, speaks about this in the gospel. But remember, too, we would say that evil can never have an existential stature on its own because God did not make it. So evil is always an absence of the good. And even when we get to the virtues, because we're going to speak about the spirituality of the virtues. The life in Christ is the life of how we adopt by grace all of those goodnesses that belong to Christ and Christ alone. Christ comes to live in us, and then we practice these virtues, which are natural then to our humanity. But evil and passions, at least, are always a failure of the virtues. You remember, I talked about this at my last Bible study. Pride is a failure of humility. humility. Right? Lust is the failure of chastity, chastity or, or purity. Um, anger is, is a failure of, let's get this one right. My spiritual father taught me this <laughs> right on the money. He, he wanted to make sure I knew exactly what uh, anger is a failure of. Take a guess what it is. Mercy, maybe, yes, but we're actually thinking of, of irritability or impatience. Guess what it's a failure of? of? Of zeal. It's a failure of zeal. Zeal is a virtue. But when we become angry, we turn zeal on its head, and we're going to be angry with somebody and, and seek, their, uh, seek something to their detriment because we're playing, we're playing God. 
So evil never exists on its own. It can exist only in a deformed state as, as being uh, something uh, where we have taken a good gift and have corrupted it uh, on our own and because of our own selfish, uh, our own selfish ends. So death is not created by God. Um, death is simply the absence of life. Where there is no life, there is death. And of course, by mortality, by death, we do not speak merely of biological death, but of the death of the human soul, the death of the human mind, and the death of the person. God has made us to be persons. And we have these human faculties that we integrate in order to become who we are as persons, body, mind, heart, and soul. And death is the dissolution of all of those human faculties. You know, uh, beginning with the mind, rebelling, the heart rebelling against God, and then ending up in the grave. Ending up in the grave. However, the way that the Holy Fathers interpret the, the arrival of death is that the Lord himself, because he is still sovereign, he will be the Lord of death as well. So he has used death for his own ends, and he will use it so that he can be the one who puts a temporary end to what? All of our suffering and all of the sinning that we do as human beings. So he has he is put a restriction on it. Irenaeus of Lyon speaks about this very well. That if we lived, um, let's say our scientists <laughs> found the, the fountain of immortality. And, and they gave us eternal life in, in these bodies. What would that life be like? It'd be pretty pitiful, right? We might hope to do some things, you know. As I get older, I'm kind of shrugging my shoulders. You know, it would have been nice to go and get this PhD. And it would still be nice, even at 61 years to go jumping out of an airplane, because I want to, you know, try a parachute out one of these days. Um, did I tell you the story? My wife said, no way you are jumping out of a plane. She says, I want to go skydiving. And she said, priests do not go skydiving. <laughs> and so I'm on, I was sent this YouTube video. You know, YouTube is, is, you can find a lot of good stuff on there. And I was sent this YouTube video of a, of a Serbian bishop in Serbia who is the, who is the chaplain of one of these um, army regiments, Serbian army regiments. And guess what? The, guess what the video, YouTube video is? All of those paratroopers are jumping out of the plane, and guess who goes last? The bishop goes last, jumping out of that plane with his paratroopers. Come here, honey. Look at this. <laughs> so, yeah, that's right. So, so I mean, we, there, there are limitations, but God has limited the damage that we can do and the suffering that we cause. Um, and um, as we're going to see... Uh, he's going to bring about something entirely new in order to accomplish his, his salvation. What does this have to do with our spirituality? It means that we have an accurate understanding of ourselves as human beings in this world. Really, we have to know ourselves. We have to know the scriptures and what they teach about the fall of Adam, the power of sin, the repetition, the repetitious destructive force of, of the passions, you know, that, that, that drive their way in, into our lives by force of habit, you know. We have to know that, and we have to know it personally. You know, we have to know what's in our own sandbox. That's what the Lord says. You know, do not judge others. Take a look at what's in, worry about your sandbox. Clean up the poop out of your sandbox before you clean up you know, the uh, twigs out of, you know, uh, someone else's. You have to see that for what it is. Um, and that is going to be, uh, that's the first great act of faith. You know, coming to terms with our brokenness and, and, and believing that even in our, our brokenness, even in our sinfulness, in, in our ignorance, in our foolishness, in our stupidity, that there is the boundless love of God, right? That's the beginning. That's the beginning, you know, to believe in that, to hope in that, 
and then we're going to, as we say, we're going to work with the Lord's grace um, on this. So the Lord uses death for his own purposes, as we will see. This is an interesting quote by Irenaeus of Lyon. Wherefore also he, the Lord, drove him out of paradise and removed him from the tree of life, not because he coveted the tree, as some venture to assert, but because he had mercy on him, that he should continue not on as a sinner forever, nor that the sin which surrounded him should be immortal. So the Lord, Lord's going to put a circle around this, right? Um, but he set a bound to his state of sin by interposing death and thus causing sin to cease, putting an end to it by the dissolution of the flesh, which should take place in the earth so that man ceasing at length to live in sin and by dying to it might begin to live to God. And there's the gospel already that we, that we see. Now, I'm going to speak about the terrible cycle. So why is it that sin enslaves and that the passions destroy? It has to do with bondage and has to do with enslavement. And there's a little bit of a difference uh, in the way that we approach this uh, being Orthodox Christians from the East and, and the difference from what you find in many of the, in, in the Western Holy Fathers. Um, you have St. Augustine who wrote volumes uh, on the scriptures and you have this so-called Augustinian understanding of sin and man's um, enslavement to sin. And Augustine, he was brilliant but he made a lot of mistakes. I remember that's what my seminary professor, uh, he was saying, we, we had weeks on Augustine, and Father John Mindor said, you know, never, never underestimate or devalue St. Augustine, because he was the greatest of the Western theologians for centuries. And even the Protestant Reformation, it's, it's kind of this Augustine thing that they're still trying to hash out, you know, in terms of, Grace, in terms of, of um, and, and so Augustine came up with this idea of original sin. And original sin for Augustine means that with the sin of Adam and Eve, we not only inherit his death, here we go, you ready? But we inherit his stain. We inherit the stain of Adam and Eve's sin. So, how do the fathers in the East understand this? They say, we have inherited something from our forefathers and our foremothers, but it's not their stain, because we can only be guilty volitionally of our own sins. That's all that the Lord expects from us. But we have inherited this tragedy of mortality. So, Adam and Eve sinned and brought death into the world, and we have received, by virtue of being their progeny, we have inherited this mortality, this mortality from them. And so you have these interesting things. We don't call it original sin. We like to call it the primordial sin, just the first sin of Adam and Eve. And it, also Hebrews, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, our Lord, likewise shared the same things. So that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. And free, and here's the kicker right here, this quote. And free those who all their lives were held in slavery by, what does it say there? The fear of death. So what drives sin is death and the fear of death. Let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. And as Father Meindorf would also say, if we're locked into our mortality, it also means that we're locked into this survival of the fittest. We must take care of our own. I must survive, and I don't care what happens to anyone else, because we're locked into this into this. Uh, fear, fear of death. We also have another interesting text from Romans. Therefore, as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men. And then we have this interesting, I don't want to get too complicated. 
we have this problem with St. Paul where he uses a phrase called the epho up here. And in the West it was translated, and in Adam all men sin, right? On account of him, epho in Greek. However, that's not what Paul means. It, it really says this, as I have it here. And so death spread to all men, and on account of death, what does it say there? All men sin. sin. That's the beginning. Sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there's no law. We just spoke about that, right? The, the, the law shows us where we are. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sins were not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come, the new Adam, our Lord Jesus Christ. So we have to look at this mystery of death and how it drives our own personal sin. If by being united to Christ and we participate in Christ's conquering of death in ourselves, what happens to the passions and what happens to sin? They're rooted, uprooted by that. So we go right to the root, which is the power of death, to effect a selfish sin in our lives. And, and that's um, uh, very, very scriptural, but often, again, not, not understood, unfortunately, by too many people. I like this quote from Father Schmidt. The world rejects its own life. This world rejected Christ, refused to see in him its own life and fulfillment. And since the world had no other life but Christ, rejecting and killing Christ, the world condemned itself to death. Its only ultimate reality is death. And none of the secular eschatology, eschatologies in which men still put their hope can have any force against the simple statement of Leo Tolstoy. After a stupid life, there comes a stupid death. <laughs> Meaning it's all absurd. You know, absurd. It's just absurd. And as long as we live after the fashion of this world and make our life in an, an, an end of itself, no meaning and no goal can stand. For they are all dissolved by death. And by eschatologies, these secular eschatologies, Father Schmemm was right, he's still during the time of, of, of communism. And communism is a secular eschatology because what do they believe in? A worker's paradise? Mm -hmm. And after socialism, you know, it's all very Hegelian. You know, you, you have, you know, you have capitalism and then it will transform itself, you know, history, dialectic, and, into socialism, but socialism is only a step on the way to capitalism, and that's the eschatology. You know, that's the perfect workman's paradise. Communism. There you are, that's communism. Um, and how many people died in the 20th century just because of these secular eschatologies? Millions. 60, 70 million people perished. Uh, because of this and exactly what, you know, Father Schmemann relates there. Okay, so, the gospel. Even though we are sinful, rebellious, deluded, exiled, enslaved, and bondaged, um, in misery, uh, in, in our foolishness, um, even though we are in all of these things, the Lord himself... He still loves us with a love which is beyond our ability to comprehend it. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Right? St. Paul, chapter 5 in his letter to the Romans. He's beginning there. St. Paul in his letter to the Romans, he has to make the gospel, he has to prove that the gospel is universal, not just to Jews, but to Gentiles. And so he levels the playing field. He says, all men have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, both Jew and Gentile. Right? Right? And then he says, but while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So we have the beginning of the gospel with this love of God, which is also, remember I said at the beginning of our class, it's a divine initiative. It's a recreation. So we have the new Adam, and I love this quote from um, 
Isaiah, remember ye not the former things, but consider the things of old. Why would Isaiah write that? Because that's what Israel did as the very basis of their faith. Their whole Israelite understanding of the universe, of the world, of their nation, their people, of the temple, uh, of the scriptures, of the kings, the priests, the prophets, all of that was bound up with the saving acts that God did for them when? In the past. In the past. And that's why we have the book of Exodus. You have the, the saving uh, of, of the Lord, the Lord's saving acts for the people of Israel. But Isaiah is going to blow this all out of the water. That's what the prophets, they love to do that. They, they love to make people's heads spin. Don't think about what God has done in the past any longer, even though we still do. Think about what God is going to do for you when? In the future, right? I will do a new thing, and it shall spring forth, and shall you not know it? Now, why does he say that? Because that's the whole basis of prophecy. The Lord will always tell his prophets what he is going to do beforehand, so that it, when it takes place, they will know that it was the Lord's work. Remember the Valley of the Dry Bones? We read it on Great and Holy Friday, right? I am the Lord your God and it finishes with these words, and I will do it. Do what? Raise the dead, right? Into this great army in the desert, right? And I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. What does the prophet mean there, Isaiah? He means I'm going to recreate a new paradise. Because what's a desert after all? The absence of life, the absence of joy, the absence of beauty, the absence of, of, of the paradise, so to speak. Um, so that's beautiful, Isaiah 43, 18 and 19. And then we have this statement in our, in our understanding. Through his incarnation, the Son of God has remade our humanity by fashioning it back into his original likeness. So the motive behind the incarnation, why did the Son of God have to become a human being? Why did he have to die on a cross? The answer to that is, this is the only way that he could refashion us. The only way that this recapitulation could happen. And our entire spiritual life is about actualizing this remaking. The Lord is remaking us. Um, and he does it to the entire people of God. He does it to, to the whole church. And in Greek... We have these amazing words in Greek. It took me a year to pronounce this, and I still can't pronounce it. The word remaking is about refashioning, and it's actually more recoining or recapitulation. Anakephaleosis. Anakephaleosis. From the word kephal, right? What is that? Head. Reheading. So the Lord is going to restart us again. He's going to give this a whole new beginning. He's going to rehead it, literally. Right? Recapitulate. That's what, it, that's what it means. And he's going to do it through himself. He is therefore in his work of recapitulation, recapitulation, summed up all things, both waging war against our enemy, the, the, the devil and, and death, and crushing him who had at the beginning led us astray, captives and Adam. The enemy would not have been fairly vanquished unless it had been a man born of a woman who conquered him. Therefore, does the Lord profess himself to be the son of man, compromising in himself that original man out of whom the woman was fashioned, in order that, as our species went down to death through a vanquished man, we might ascend to life again through a victorious one. That means a victorious man. And as through a man, death received the palm of victory, that is, through the old Adam, against us. So again, by a man, we might receive the palm against death. Um, very, very beautiful, uh, the meaning of this. So, this reheading or recapitulation takes place through the death, burial, and resurrection of the Son of God. And this is why every Sunday in the Orthodox Church is a little Easter. This is why Easter, the resurrection, is at the very heart, the center of, 
our Christianity. It's at the very center of everything that we experience in the spiritual life. So by his death, Christ destroys death. We should all know that, especially after this season. How many times are we singing, Christ is risen from the dead, trampling. trampling down death by death, by death having trampled down death, right? Um, and he does it. The Western theologians, why did Christ die on the cross? Because he had to appease the justice and, and appease the wrath of the Father. Well, the Father is not, he's not that wrathful, angry, vengeful God that, that some used to think of. Christ dies on the cross in order to destroy and conquer death because that's the only way he could have done it. It's the only way he could have done it. Um, so the resurrection of Christ is a new creation. It's a new fiat. What do we mean by that? A new beginning. It's a new beginning. Um, and in the scriptures we find that it's a new beginning because Christ has opened for us a way a new way that leads us back to paradise again, that leads us into the mystery of the, of the resurrection. Um, and this is why Paul especially refers to the resurrection of Christ as first fruits. So he's saying that something new is taking place that's already begun in Christ as a human being, yes, as the Son of God, but that if we unite ourselves to him, then we will be resurrected and participate in his new life as the harvest, the full harvest of this first fruits, right? Very beautiful, very beautiful allegory. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then the, they that are Christ at his coming, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So Christ is the perfect man, and the measure of our humanity is, is the Lord himself. And so we have this double revelation. And the double revelation is that not only has the Lord shown us who God is in his one and only Son, what's the most perfect picture or icon of who God is? Who can tell me tonight? Where do we find the perfect picture of who God is? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, be a little bit more specific. On the cross. On the cross. Absolutely. There is no other more perfect picture of who God is than his son, the son of the Father's love, hanging dead on the cross, having poured himself out for uh, the salvation of all men. Um, and so we not only see who God is in terms of this giving God, um, this serving God, this selfless God, the God who empties himself completely. Um, Paul writes about that also very beautiful in his letter to the Philippians. Have this mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though being in the form of God, did not count equality God something to be grasped. But instead, he humbled himself to a slave, to the form of a slave. And having humbled himself, he humbled himself to death and even death on them cross. See, this is how Paul speaks of the, 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 the condescension, um, all because of his love. Um, we see who God is, but in this revelation of Christ as the Father's love, as the Son of the Father's love, because he's also a human being, we see who? We see who we are. And in Christ, we discover who we are as human beings. In Christ, we discover who we are as human persons, as human persons, where we're clueless about it otherwise. We really are. We have no idea about who we are unless we come, you know, to this, you know, face-to-face, -face, uh, you know, I like to say we have to face the music, you know, fake, face the music with the Lord, and then he'll really show us who we are. There's a good quote that I like also from St. Irenaeus of Lyon, whom we have quoted a bit tonight. The glory of God is man made fully alive. What does he mean by that? The glory of God in this creation is best realized through the human person because he lives in the image and likeness of God. So the glory of God is man made fully alive. And then what's the second part of that statement? And the life of man 
is the vision of God. The life of man is the vision of God. How we see God is our life. And everything in, in that envisioning begins and ends with who? With the God, the Son of God, the Son of the Father's love, who hangs dead on his cross. So that, that's very important. I mentioned that Christ opens for us a new way. Um, in the scriptures, the letter to the Hebrews, we have this word pioneer. Who are the two most famous pioneers in American history? Lewis, Lewis and Clark. Clark. And what did they do that changed American history? Is they went beyond the Mississippi River. They went beyond the city of St. Louis. They followed the Missouri River all the way up, right? They followed all the way up through Missouri and then through South Dakota, North Dakota, into Montana where they found the head of the rivers and then they went all the way to what is now Oregon and spent a very lonely and very destitute winter on the Pacific Ocean and then had to hack their way all the way back to where they started and, and this pioneering journey I think took three or four years, three or four years. It's a fascinating. But, you know, when we were children, we were junior high school students. Well, they used to. They probably don't anymore because it's, you know, it's, well, they've deconstructed it, you know. But it's history, you know, whether it's something negative or something positive. Uh, the, 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 you know, these pioneers, they opened the way for exploration, you know, to the rest of the country. And, and Lewis and Clark did that after what event? So we're going to, we'll, we'll, we'll do a little side note here. What happened that Lewis and Clark were given the green light to do this, to do this pioneer. Louisiana Purchase. Or? The Louisiana Purchase, very good. And why did the why did the French have to surrender up all that beautiful territory? Because because of, war or something? because of all the wars and because they were fighting the, the the they were fighting not really the Germans but they were fighting the Prussians and Frederick the Great and then they had been worn down by the French Revolution and blah 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 blah, right. I know there's a little bit of history, but Christ is the one who opens this way for us to ascend into the kingdom of God. Not merely at the end of time, but when? In the here, the now, in the present. Um, if we have time to get to spirituality and sacraments and liturgy, this is really what it's all, um, all focusing on. Is, is this Paschal journey that takes place as we... Uh, move forward and we move upward into the kingdom of God through the mystery uh, of the church's life. It's such a beautiful thing, isn't it? We're, we're celebrating this season of Pascha for 40 days and then 50 days we have the season of Pentecost. So Pascha, the whole year is Pascha. We can't have Pentecost unless we have Pascha. And then even after we celebrate Pentecost, According to the calendar of our church, if we look on all of those weeks, it says the first week after Pentecost, the second week of Pentecost. It doesn't even say after. I was wrong. The first week of Pentecost. Pentecost week. It's Pentecost all the way through. Pentecost isn't just stop and it's over. You know, clean up the church. We, we threw a bunch of leaves and, and greeneries around. No, the whole thing, the whole church year is, is, is about Pentecost. Second Sunday of Pentecost, third Sunday of Pentecost, fourth Sunday of Pentecost. And it's Pentecostal because it's Paschal. And this is the journey that we take in the mystery of the church's life. Um, and um, you can't be Orthodox for three seconds without picking that up, right? Okay, so I think I'm going to stop there and we'll start this. I want to start speaking about some practical things about prayer. Uh, we're going to pick up on personal prayer and corporate prayer. We often forget that they are symbiotic, that all prayer, no matter what, whether it's in the closet or whether it's in the church, is the prayer of the body of Christ. And as we're going to see, I mean, the scripture is also pretty clear, especially in the letter of the Hebrews, St. Paul especially, when he speaks about prayer as the intercession of the Holy Spirit, praying within us, interceding on behalf of our own weaknesses, that prayer is also only one prayer. It's the prayer of Christ. 
our prayer becomes the prayer of Christ that he offers up before the Father in perpetual, in perpetuate, how do you say it? Perpetuity. Perpetuity, thank you. See? Um, this is the divine liturgy. Is Christ's own prayer that he offers to the Father. It's why when we get to the anaphora, we stop praying. Pay attention to the pronouns, right? Pay attention to the nouns. It's no longer um, a prayer that is offered to Christ. It's no longer prayer that's offered through the Holy Spirit. It's prayer that's offered to the Father because it's Christ's own prayer. It's, it's just remarkable. It's this remarkable thing. But we're going to speak more in depth about um, the nature of personal prayer, what Christ speaks of as prayer in the closet, and then a bit about our corporate prayer, about how those two prayers, you know, are linked together. So that when we pray at home, we are preparing ourselves for the liturgical act where we pray with one voice, one mouth, and one heart. And when we pray at church and, and, and receive into our bodies the, the, the body and blood of Christ, what does that do for our personal prayer at home? It empowers it again. You can see how they are, are very much um, linked together. But I'll stop there tonight. Let's, anybody have, let's take time for some questions. Yes. Liliana. Father, uh, you mentioned something about Holy Friday. Yes. Uh, wounds, the human races. Yes. And the lately, I would say I probably this year was really full of a lot of people are being called by God. Mm. And especially I have friends that are Catholics, uh, Protestant, whatever. And majority of them are they come to accept we don't want to be buried, whatever, or our parents are not buried, gonna be buried in the mm -hmm. uh, in the cemetery. And then I would say ninety percent of the funeral that I it's called memory. Or cremation. Cremation. Right. What and you know what I just flew back from Florida. The doctor sitting next to me, she said that she threw ashes, ashes in the into the island, ocean. Yeah. But I swim. Oh, her mom, I was shaking. I said, Is this a good yeah. doctor? She's talking about yeah. that she's throwing her mom ashes. Uh, yeah. So I don't know, is this a church letting us to do is that a normal for No. Actually, and here's the reason, and we we've touched on it here. You know, the, the Orthodox Church. You know, we we have this sense that the only kind of fish that's that flow downstream are what kind of fish? Dead Don, fish. Dead fish flow with the current. Right? You know, so to be alive means sometimes to, to fight against the current, to, to move against the current. Um, dead fish are the only fish that, that flow with the current. So, but why do we insist on this? We don't judge other people. You get cremated, okay, you're outside of the church, we pray for you, that's fine. However, why is cremation a problem for Orthodox Christians? And it's canonically imposed that we are forbidden to burn the body. There's a historical reason for it. Because, remember, the church understood what was going on around its culture. And in the East and in the Far East... You had this sense that the human body was something that was innately evil. It was a prison of the soul. The body was a prison. It was a veil of tears. And that the only way you could liberate the soul from this flesh, this rotting flesh, was to burn it. And this is still practiced in, in many Oriental religions. It's the way that you release the, this, the soul so that it can ascend the, to, the, to the divine again. So the church looks at this and says, uh, no. Because the church receives what the scriptures are teaching us, that the body itself that we have received from God, even in our fallen, broken state, this body, your body, my body, you know what, you know, when we get into our 60s, you know, everything goes <laughs> south. Right? You know? And, um, good old gravity. Good old gravity. You know, but that body still, it's, it's holy. It's a sacred thing, even, even from what we do to the body. 
No matter what somebody does to their, you know, tattoo it, okay, you know, it's, it's wrong, I'm sorry. Um, you know, you've been tattooed when you, you know, have your chrism, you know, put on you. I had a conversation with some of my children about it. But, you know, um, um, but anyway, this, this idea that the body is holy, and it is holy because it participates in the image of God. Not just the mind, not just the heart, not just the soul, but the body too. And so we return the body to the earth because the earth is our mother in this sense. And it's a blessing for us to return to the, to the earth from which we came. See what I'm saying? Um, and that's the way that we honor the body. And it's also scriptural. Christ says that unless a seed does what? Dies and is buried in the ground, it cannot come to life. Because, yeah. so don't we also believe that in the resurrection, when we are all resurrected, we have a new body. New body, new heaven, new earth, yes. and the exactly. whole body is resurrected. The, the, a new body is resurrected. It doesn't have to be, somebody asked me, is it going to be from the same stuff? No. <laughs> right, we don't know. That's a mystery, right? Our bodies will be like the resurrected body of Christ. I mean, that's very clear in the scriptures. However, it still means that we, we respect the body as a temple of the Holy Spirit. The body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And so we do not bless a cremation for this reason. I've had pastoral situations where, you know, a, a non-Orthodox wife has come to me and said, my husband, he was Orthodox and... and uh, he used to go to the Orthodox Church, and we cremated him two weeks ago. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> you know, I'm like, well, they don't even know. You know, so you have to be careful. So, you know, what we do is get a blessing from the bishop, and we do a memorial sometimes. But it depends on the situation. If a person says, I don't care what the church teaches, I believe in what I believe, and I want to be cremated because it's easier and it's certainly cheaper, which is also a moral problem. You know, um, ten thousand dollars is a cheap funeral these days, and and that's immoral, at least you know in my book. Um, then we're probably not going to bury him, you know, um, only because of you know the 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 attitude. Um, but that's that's the answer to the question. Yes, Roger. The statement that Satan has the power of death has always troubled me in a way, and I don't quite fully understand. What that means. Okay, so remember that a Satan is fairly limited in his powers, but he's still stronger. <laughs> you know, in the Gospel of Mark, he's called the strong man. Right. You know, Christ comes and binds up the strong man and steals all of his possessions. That's one of the earliest, one of the er early um, parables. You know, so, and, and the power of Satan is deception. Through that deception, comes sin and death. So there is kind of a toxis. There's an, there's an order to it. Okay. And also remember that from the very beginning, uh, the devil has deceived and sought to destroy humanity, human beings like you and I. And the word that they use in the scriptures is out of guile. Right? So this is where, you know, we see that the hatefulness you know, and the division, it, that's, that's all from the devil. When I, when I see families and when I see communities that are split apart and they're fighting and they're arguing and sometimes they're all screaming, you know, I, I, say, to, I say to myself, well, it's not really them. It's just the demons are screaming. Because who, who screams? Nobody screams in the scriptures except the demons. And, and if we're screaming at each other, you know, we, we've let ourselves, and, and God knows that I have done that myself on many occasions, mostly with my children, <laughs> right? So we all know how easy it is to, to lend ourselves, you know, to that. So that, uh, that is probably the answer that, r remember, Satan can only deceive, he can only lie, but that through that lie, comes he leads us on, on, on the pathway. But also, you know, the fathers are here saying to us, Adam and Eve 
okay, they made this great catastrophe, but what have we received from them is their mortality. Not their sin, but their mortality. Mm -hmm. And so we have to come to terms with our mortality, trampled down death by death, in, in order to be liberated from the, the law and the power of sin, which is always connected to that fear, fear of death. But you know? aren't, don't we have the tendency to sin? And that's through mortality too. It is? Yeah, sure. Um, because it all strikes back to the fact that we cannot be guilty of somebody else's sin, only our own. So, the, which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Which comes first for us is clearly the mortality. From the soil of our mortality grows up the passions and the sins. When, how many of us are parents here? We've all given birth and raised our children. Most of us, right? We hold in our arms these beautiful little babies. And they are just pure, right? They're just bright. They're brilliant. They're new. They smell good. You know, their feet are just beautiful things. And then they grow up into teenagers. Even they grow up into two-year-olds. And, and they grow up into two-year-olds again. I mean, they grow up into these creatures that we call, you know, call teenagers. And you still love them. But, you know, about... One month, four or five weeks in, you really see that old Adam kick in. Oh, 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 yes. Because you know what the first, you know, and then child psychologists, you know how human beings, we learn how to do this, to, sh to shake our heads and say, no, 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 that's what the, the children, the child comes to. Because the mother sticks food in the child's mouth and the child says, ugh. <laughs> yeah. and turns from it, right? Yeah. I think it's true. But there's, there's still something of that, and we're saying that if we say it's the child that's at fault, then, then we, we blaspheme God's creation. If we say that this child has inherited, as we all have, uh, this disease of, of mortality, then we're on the right road. And that's why we baptize babies and chrismate them, and commune them from the very get-go. You know, why do you baptize and chrismate and commune your babies? They don't know what's going on. It doesn't do them any good. You know what you say? Well, why do you give that baby a bottle that has no understanding of, of what digestion is or, or what nutrition is? The baby needs the bottle. You know, and if you don't give the baby a bottle, we're going to lock you up and throw you in prison. You know, so it's, it's the same thing. The babies need to be fed and nurtured with these spiritual gifts as well. Any other questions? Yes, Joe. Why exactly does the fear of death lead to sin? That's the kicker. Okay, let's go back to the scriptures. So if our life is limited, right, and we have no faith, we have no hope, we're living in not, what's your life all, all about? Finding pleasure in the moment. Party hardy. Yeah. 24 hour party people. They used to be a rock band, I think. Nothing against the church. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, you only have one life to live. I grew up watching football with my dad, and it was either ham, remember ham beer, or perhaps Blue Rich. Go for the gust. This is in the 1960s. Go for the gusto. You only have one life to live. And our, you know, everything, we're all like, we're all like, you can't drive down the freeway without having that thrown in your face, you know? Why do you think, I mean, I'm, I'm driving up for a meeting in Niles, and you know how many signs I pass for men for balding hair? Mm -hmm. Restore 54, <laughs> is that the sign? I like six signs. I don't see that. Yeah, neither do I, <laughs> who cares? But what's it playing on? It's playing on our vulnerability, and we're vulnerable to that, because of our mortality, Jesus. also fear, called old fear age. Of death and fear of death. Self-preservation. Self-preservation. That's the key. Me before you. Me before you. That's exactly where um, this, this all comes into play. But also the idea that we're born and we die, and the only thing that matters is, is have a good time as much as we possibly can while, while we live on this 
on this earth. And that's east of Nod. He who dies with the most toys wins. He who dies with the most toys, toys wins. Now what's fascinating, and we'll stop here, is that when you go down that road, and all of us have, each in our, in our own stupid, foolish, ridiculous way, when we go down that road, we're looking for happiness, and we're looking for freedom, and we're looking for, uh, you know, making our life. It doesn't make us happy. No. It makes us miserable. Yeah. Does it make us rich? Ma makes us poor. Does it make us wise? <laughs> makes us stupid, right? Does it lead to anything good? No, it leads to death and destruction. And what parable is that? It's a parable of the prodigal son, right? The parable of the prodigal son. That's also a parable about delusion, as sin is delusion, of give me what you said, right? I'm going to die in, how did you say it? Um, well, Self-preservation. Self yeah. The son comes to the father and says, give me what belongs to me. I could care less about you or your house. I demand you to give me what, why? Because it's self-preservation. I want to live my life, you know, in my own way. And then what happens? Makes we, a mess. we all know the story. Right? So, I mean, and that's all of our, that's all of our lives. But I like that parable because it's very clear. Rebellion, delusion, exile, poverty, enslavement, misery, and then there's one more step, and that belongs to the older brother in the parable, and that's spiritual death. Because the real point of the parable is that the older brother who could not love or forgive goes through all of those steps in an instant and ends up dead. Because where is the older brother at the end of the parable? Outside of the father's house. Self-imposed, right? Self-imposed outside. He doesn't want to come in, even though they're begging him to come in and forgive and, and, and all of this. So it's pretty... Okay, so we'll continue on. Yes, okay, stay. I have one more question. We were talking about Satan, but I get confused between Satan, Lucifer, Beelzebub, who are... are okay, so... Are they like rings? So no, no, they're different terms in the scriptures that are used for the father of lies. So the devil in the, in the original is called the diabolos, which means the divider, the one who breaks apart, right? When Jesus comes to Peter and says, Satan has demanded to have you so that he can sift you like wheat, crush you, splinter you to pieces. That's the divider, that's the devil. Satan is the one who opposes the adversary, the one who fights against you. He fights against God, he opposes God. He's God's adversary. He's everybody's adversary, right? Lucifer is one of the prophetic names for the angel of light. He was an angel of light before uh, the beginning uh, of the human creation, and he fell away. We also find this alluded to in, in the prophecy of Isaiah. But there's another, one more word for uh, the devil in the scriptures. I can't remember. Beelzebub. 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 Yeah, Beelzebub is, is, has a more historical connection in the Old Testament, I think, to also um, um, the, the, the father of lies. Uh, but also, Beelzebub had a connotation with the idol, uh, Baal. Um, so it, it was connected there, and I don't know. I'll have to go do some homework on it. Uh, right. I think it's Lord of the Flies or something. Lord of the Flies, yeah. That's what it meant. So all of these are terms for Satan, Satan. For evil, for Satan. Right. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for listening to lis listening tonight. And um, we actually had a little bit of sun this evening, and you came out, even though we could have been outside in this nice weather after mm -hmm. after six months of <laughs> misery. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. Let's close it. So next week, remember that we're going to do Vespers, Great Vespers, for the Feast of Ascension. And then we'll carry on again, because I at least want to get through the part about prayer before we conclude. But we'll go on probably through most of the month of June in order to bring this series to a close. Joe, you want to do the honors?